Welcome to Tabula Poetica 2013. This is the kickoff event. We have a fantastic poet here to talk with you this afternoon. Um, as we're gearing up to hear what she has to say, take out your cell phones and turn them off so they don't ring while the poet is talking. And the poet will do the same. <laughs> Um, I want to thank uh, numerous people and entities for making this series happen. Of course, the English department and the chair, Joanne Eleven, has been incredibly supportive of this series. And the dean of Wilkinson College, Patrick Fury, has been a longtime supporter. Um, in addition, uh, we have small grants from poets and writers. And they continue to encourage us to do the kinds of things that we do. I want to also remind you that there is a reading at 7 p.m. So this afternoon is a poetry talk, and then Maureen Alsop will be uh, reading from her own work this evening at 7 o'clock. And if you don't have the book yet, books will be available for purchase then. This afternoon, we have a special treat, um, and that is Calvin Penix, a recent MFA alum, and he's going to introduce the poet today. I want to thank um, Anna Leahy and Tabula Poetica for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to be here. And um, I, was, I, I wanted to share with you, too, that this will be a sort of a multimedia um, presentation. There's a slideshow with it, but um, when I originally developed the slideshow, I had put the recordings into the slides. So that won't be present. I'll be reading, actually, um, what I've written. But it may not be completely in sync. So I'm going to ask you to just you know, like you're going down a river, just enjoy. Maybe it's not all connecting, but relax and enjoy what you hear. Um, and the topic today is self-portrayal. And I thought that in this new millennium with, um, you know, Facebook and everyone's taking pictures of themselves, and there's sort of that element of, um, you know, self-portraits have been around for a long time. Um, originally, I came here to read last spring um, from a book of persona poems. So at this point, I've moved from persona into sort of this whole, whole sort of self-exploratory. And one thing I learned in this process was that um, self-portraits do not require my own finger click. So I didn't take all the pictures myself, but I sort of directed, designed what you'll see. So without further ado, I will just start everything rolling and um, read to you from The Flowering Self, Smaller, Frozen. Um, so The Flowering Self, Smaller, Frozen. Self-portrayal is a tool for understanding intimacy and the wider aspect of consciousness. I transcend the self through the self I allow myself to be identified. I connect awareness as projection, as a physical element. I'm a perpetual ephemera. I recognize myself as you. In context, I am shadow. 
In order to see myself, you must see yourself. Maureen, I see after all these years, you've thoroughly embraced social media. Hope your career hasn't suffered any. Back at you. Presently, the empire recedes. We are corrected, or we are alone. Presently, I am part of the dog pack at the end of the table. No, we may no longer go to the caves, no matter how they please us. I saw myself shine. I saw an airiness beyond me. I saw that you were walking inside the map, unburdened. That time when the narrow depth of the water bore us. My net message was the need for truth. I filled a bucket with coins and gave my gatherings to the soldiers. Inconsolable that every pinch of flower-shaped flame might loosen from me. Where might I keep the small armatures? I cannot begin with a metaphor. You who were in pieces, it was insistent work, quickened by observation. But hadn't we been warned? What we saw was not the same as what we understood. I tried to find in every person the wrong, in, the, in the wrong so that I might recognize my true hollow. When will you choose to know me? Will you linger there? Will the great pull of air around you do the same? Will the cold fall away from the underbody? Then, as you are telling in brimstone the lies that you tell the liars, then will you remember the advantages we shared? Perhaps now I am your empire, you who created me with openings through time. I will not clear this of you. I followed you as well as I could through silver corridors, entered the topmost valley of the sky beyond the whole of the sun. You wore gloves. Christmas snow pasted its voluminous pages over alleys, oxen, you were among spindled volumes of wool season's ornamentation. Clay layerings, my internal pigeons, were indiscriminate. The flowering self, smaller, frozen. Yeah, it was fine, I guess. Here I am looking upon a page upon which a woman is looking into the font as if drawn into what is real. The emergence of idealizing eyes falls upon trees, trenchant her distant, the mount of the, her sea-smooth iris, firs, the willow, are perfect listeners. Real silence traces change along the darkened corners of her composed mouth. Snow covets the lilies, thickly astonished. You are so near. I trace the river which breathes through our sleep. I guard the given valley. Sometimes I breathe a reversal, your mind winding back, sacred and unaccustomed to place. Sometimes we are modestly smaller than our disappearing. But if this were to be read aloud, as I read it, I begin to imagine our love has been like connectivities beneath the grass, indeterminate voices buried, splice the whole of the inland together. I displace myself so I might be true to the wrong words. Among tangled patterns, we shift between gullies, grassland, mountainous, irregular, swoon, birth heavy. At times we were fired, sardonic, we are sinister in tone, surrender beggar, we are multitudinous. The sojourners tried designating the world to the darkness to the reflect the way I am. Then they created their protections. When did I unclench their papers? I was adorned again, that hiddenness made open. The spoils of my old self were dragged to the hilltop. To be criticized, I was percussive, and I refused to hide my dead. Untutored were the examined trees above me, punctual trees, heavy and ridden by snow's asymmetry. Perhaps this was how I developed my sensitivity for unsteady measure. No there. This half-hidden, silver, broken palette, blue gradient of mid-heaven. Bright was my disappointment to summon what might already be perceived. Grief's compression and renewal were not wedded to the things I fed you. 
Dear MJ, for Scythia's impossibly small blossoms were promised, but these mouthed back earthward, what body part, what geogra geography, indecipherable, my fingers archipelago strums uncertain foliage, where a second season moves through me unacknowledged. Today, when I stood in the street, I felt my shadow burn its betrayal through the pavement. I recognized my heart's sobriety as a true misfit. I wanted to tell my old lovers that they could all stand next to me, that the draining of blood from their lips was anger, not, not abandonment. I wanted to explain to them, shoulder to shadow, that when they passed through the waters, I would be with them, and when they passed through the rivers, they would not be overwhelmed. When they walked through fire, they would, not be, they would be bridegrooms, not strangers, unrecognized by flame. I fear my own interpretation of self as selfless, as if once given, I will be permanently troubled. My words cross through the law. Our children will gossip, live with dreams knotted to the back of their throat. The air in the next century will be thin, their voices misunderstood. They will pray as if to a secretly dressed tribe whose image will be found in stale envelopes. It might be someone like, uh, like this who blesses us. Yours, Jay. You are engaging a meditation on your death. Perhaps you broke the law, but it was an old law, a lost aria, unenforced. You are held in the residue and aesthetic disaffiliation, sleep's epigraph, your eyes guarded by sixpence, silvered shine of wolfhounds. At the feast, they set a place for you among the dead. Cold stars languish under your crane skin dress. Hornet's nest kept in your hair's gust. Inexplicable speech. Moth light over gray sh meadow. You taste the hum in the walls where the mule stood over the glass riverbank. Sparrow stasis. For each animal there is a trade. There is a wormhole upon the forehead. Bonfire constellations, maggot conscience. You'd been walking between bonfire's remains. The dappled throng. Through the small barn window, you saw the blistered flank of the fur-licked cattle. Belief in the body is attempted, form found without words, form given. Leaving the mind starts out as a little joke. Here, spiritism is a woman riding a colt. The space toward which she is moving is an immeasurable dark. How did you think things would improve? She gives the knight the permission to erase the host. Your architectures had always been enough, and perfectly therein. Yesterday, having returned from the dialect, opening from the trance of my small death, I read the dull arrangement, solving what had gone extinct under quivering waters. The studded plains were small, studied voices, the activity of convergence, an eluded dialogue. Listening offered charms, a prod of trinkets. Those who I met through the stubble over the canyon's platinum topography asked me to ask for myself into the kill of winter. This is what I took from the landscape, as if collections of pebbles become administrative, communal. Rescue by rescue, someone will be worth the trawl. The redirection that you think you agreed to is a tendency, infrastructure impaired by vibration and extinguishment. Visually loyal to the mind of the learner, smoke trees drop a euphoric identity. This is clinical to their nature. A luggage of small leaves signal images, crucial imitations which wood pigeons sing. What did I carry, asking the years I loved, 
to be held in bottles slung from strings around my neck. And what does it mean when all the horses you pass in the fields are lying down? I gathered a sense of how the human face demands rooms by which to mark calendars. Then I made a record of whose singing was enough. When my flock was sent to the egress, it seemed as if hundreds of horses traversed the open grassland. When somehow I'd followed back into the mire, their quick crescent-shaped steps, when I stood, somehow stalled, a sense of the last ghost was conveyed to me as a guide. The day you died, we cut off three slips of your hair, as is the custom. I asked myself if grief's capacity, in part, is joy for its certainty, and, that, and because there is now an actual hour between the hour, it is my recompense. Together, we'd been versions of gathering and stopping. Breath volunteered its kind-hearted calmness. You'd found that going was up to the touch. Eventually, we are all in such a position as you once were. I know you tried hard. It made you quicken. The rain chased you with its cool evidence, its myth-making clarity. Moss inscribed you were evidently lungs and nouns and the last plot upon which no one could center. Maybe the physicality of sound the surround of the inordinate laughter was compost to make a new story. You were the last word I could cook for food. And I have loved the top view of your weathers, crisscrossing the spaces just long enough to swim among your underbodies chill. When the soul's photons buried in the passing train when this is you, the point we begin, a gallery of leaves, a river of light, spaces just long enough to be remembered, shuffled images pooled. Or because I remember thinking of the point at which there would be no waiting, I might sit, gathering the full stop of us. Either way, all my protections go unmeasured, there is a minuscule grotto inside my heart where votives remain lit. A scrim of bird oil sullies the glass. I am tracing the veins on your temples in the mirror, opening a new woman in the glass. So I say to myself, so saying to you as if you were another, well, this is one way that we might continue to speak so that I might go outside into the world soon and love only this other. Eventually we dream a deeper black, beyond the workings of smooth numbers, variant windows. In the end you would reveal you were both the carrier and interpreter of dreams, scarred only at the center of intuition. I was the myth of what you had hidden. I had already given you a plan heliocentric smoke signals. Sunwise, sojourner, I told you you must shut the one sparrow within your mouth, shut within Vesper the whole of the afternoon. You knew without doubt the incomplete animal I'd become. Small vice, my delusion. You multiplied the, de the consequence of the dead. You whispered it. You blessed fields. Among patterns in my voice, you tarried. I followed your irregular direction, the necessary fragment, later knives and trees. You appeared to pass among those I loved. Quickly you offered blight, bright hawks as swift shimmering geometric, spotted leaves you encouraged among maples. 
What supplication must failure bring me? Your location's trail permits a cold grace. My feck of immunity, your air. Without my armor, I accepted the lashing. There of the mind, a mind misled by spring's snow pink landscape. My mouth paralleled the descent of soused kestrels shaped by April rain. As my rigorous objective became the utterance of failure. Still, I continued to explain. We'd made a pact, buried plastic morphine vials in the sand, read the status of waves from our impaired instruments. Our aspersions were the little spaces between each crest. Waves by which loose doors, I'm glad I'm not the only one that does that. <laughs> Still, I continue to explain, we'd made a pact, buried plastic morphine vials in the sand, read our status of waves from our impaired instruments. Our aspersions were little spaces between each crest, waves by which we floated in houseboats, waves in which loose doors slammed back and forth, waves um, beyond which we could see pine groves and a harbor's entry where love's limited aspects alluded to channels of reflection and echo. But the waves were her breath and we were watching her die, her transience, not air, traveled cavernous passages through stone. Hardwood walls and Nagahide sofas offered us optimism. We'd been fools for the other country. Our seven mouths hurt. Of teeth, our hurt bore jaws, clenching. We're down within us and beyond ourselves, staring back up outside of us. Buoyancy started as I upon the lips. This fragment was both worthy and necessary. Later, phone books, trees, all papery sounds mingled. A new brokerage of skin. I assigned ideas to the sound's currents. Every silver scaled horn, every owl. I said, listen, long haired one. Listen, beholden transient. Eat your crust, belch morrow. In every pith white, immaculate, clairvoyant room, you must press your lips to the wall. Here, some version of a cockroach. Foreground, seaweed sound. All this against the luminous glare. What have you declared? Contact with the suddenness in unison. What have you declared? The root of my beauty is a lion's tuft. Tricky one. So casual. So clinical. Because the dark lifted, leaving a silver mottled snow. I was told to live a while in the hallway where roots held the rafters in place. That evening, we wore our best country vestments, hair shirts and tweed jackets. We looked at ourselves as foreigners. We looked at ourselves as voices separated the air with apostrophes. We thought we recognized the, her voice in the distance. We drank bourbon from styrofoam cups we were given permission to touch the violet strangle of her hair, her sunlight, her sunlit skin, our egrets shaped silhouettes offered gawky silence. In her absence, we collaborated with what we knew of instruction. We deployed filters to exhume long-term memories of Pacassandra riverbanks. Moss leached our veins. Why did no one greet us? Why were the letters in our last name the wrong shape? meaning we didn't know who we belonged to anymore. Upon her, cremations, upon her cremation, fire's accusation followed me. Garlands of wheat yellow smoke stained my words into an inarticulate tangle. My tentative remedy was a sideways embroidery, stitchery of her face through long closeted collections of soft cotton dresses walking shoes, stacks of bills. I curtsied the smolder, its geranium flavored boughs, its purple coxcomb, attic of shadows. I passed its notes downward through the mythology of the body's cells. Its processional of blue torchlit horns and grumbled flowers hungered for my grandfather's early death, forgiveness. 
I would not be smothered by its loudly sarcastic joy. Apprentice I was, not inexperienced. I remain incrementally equipped. That's the last image. So I, um, that, that basically rounds up the sort of essay that I composed for this presentation. And um, it is abstract, but I think the, the image is actually sort of grounded the writing for me. And, and the, in terms of process, I was asked to um, submit some blog posts to Superstition Review. And I, I was thinking, it was around October, and I was um, thinking about you know, All Souls Day, November 1st, and um, I began with the meditation on my death. And so then I sort of liked this idea of costuming. And I had a friend who is a photographer, and that's where I learned that self-portraits don't necessarily have to be, you know, you taking the picture, or you painting, the, you know, yourself. It can be, um, so you, you saw in one of the shots, my husband was there in the mirror. Um, so I sort of designed all the, um, the backdrops and the idea, which was based on the, the written piece. So I, I hope this was, uh, you know, something to inspire you. As I said, you know, we're in a new era now with Facebook and all sorts of, so the thought of um, how you perceive yourself, how you project yourself, um, and learning about yourself, which is really what writing is about, it is a process of um, coming to understand who you are through your experience of uncovering your own psyche. Um, so this was also, um, in part, you know, written about my mother's death and um, the whole idea of, you know, that we are all transients in life. That, um, you know, so um, I don't have any other conclusions. Yes. Um, so my class is actually going to do their final portfolios as Prezi presentations. Oh. And I wonder if you could talk more about sort of the the nitty gritty. It sounds like you wrote everything first and then decided the imagery or did then the imagery lead you to write new things? Can you talk about how yeah. the parts how they came together day by day how, how this happened? Yeah, well uh, one of the, the focal points I guess was this idea of seasons which I think is sort of clear in the, in the visual images. So I, the first post I began with um, this idea of the, the All Souls Day, the Day of the Dead, the meditation on death which was in the fall and then as it turned out, it didn't get posted until um, December. And I was like, oh, I missed you know, that whole season. And I had a friend who said, well, how do you know what happens unless you live through the season? And then it, and then it, it arrives. So everything was sort of off sync as I started writing. But I decided I would then kind of use the Celtic months for you know, the, the actual seasons, um, which are more than just four. There's eight. There's a, a wheel of seasons. Um, as a foundation to write from. So like each season, um, the first beginning, which was not the, maybe the beginning of, a, of an actual calendar year, um, but the beginning, which is the meditation on one's um, non-existence, death, you know, um, and then moving through there towards each season. So winter, spring, summer, broadly. Um, and so the image is kind of naturally, because I had that idea in mind, um, but sometimes I would write something and, then I, and I would maybe catch an, an idea of what I'd like to take a photograph related to. Other times we just played around with different um, ideas I had about things I'd like to try making a visual image from and then the writing came that, from there. So it was a bit of both with the, the, the writing to the work and then the, the work of the visual images um, responding to the written word. Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting how you were speaking to us, preparing it with these pictures that almost could be any woman, or mm. there's just a feel to it that was, I, I was thinking like these pictures are going to be like really clear, it's going to be her, who she is, and they are, but just in a way that was unexpected. Mm. And I think that's the thing that's exciting, is that anyone, that any one of you who went out to, to create something about yourself might come up with something that's much different. There might be somebody who 
does a whole self-portrait project with no images of themselves at all, or someone who does you know every single shot and it's always a close-up, or who knows? You know, what I mean, I think that's what it makes um, for interesting writing, interesting creating, interesting art, um, all of that combined. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think the writing kind of ended up fitting with the obscurity to some degree with the, um, yeah. because it came a really lyrical piece for me. Um, do you often write off of sort of like a theme? Because you were um, mentioning how you were writing off of the Celtic seasons. Um, and I noticed in Mantic, a lot of the poems are like um, derived from different types of divination. Do you find that that's something that works for you? I sometimes just become really obsessed with certain things, and then I, I want to see, see it through to the end of how far I can take it. And like I'm still writing even now divination, you know, poems related. Um, and, I, and I still like to take you know, photographs. I get an idea or a piece of writing that comes to me. So I do get onto an idea, and then I just keep clawing at it. And, and I hope that I never stop. Like I hope that you know, in another um, 10, 15 years, I'll have maybe similar photographs of myself that, that are different, that are a different context or a, um, that, so all of it just keeps going. But I, I do tend to like, and it wasn't always that way with my writing. Sometimes um, things come to me a little bit more randomly and then I just enjoy that process. But um, I, so it's a bit of both. Mm-hmm. Mm Yeah, and you know, I, I really think poetry in its um, kind of, I don't want to say, like in its highest form sort of gives us that foundation that life is transient and that we are passengers through time um, on earth. Because um, the poetry I, I feel like I connect with is the kind of, that I will go back to to be reminded of that message, you know? Um, and it, even though it sounds like it's harsh, it actually gives me a sense of comfort <laughs> because the language can be so beautiful when, when it's experienced that way. And in fact, you know, here we are, I mean, even the Bible itself kind of have, have, has references like that that, you know, um, are, that move us through time um, and, that, and, and, and in beautiful language. So it's something I think that's universal about language and, and writing and why we write, you know, to record who's come before us and um, to leave something behind. Not that, that we can because things are so ephemeral often, but, um, but we make that attempt, sort of like being in the cave, you make the little scratch on the wall to say that you were there somehow. So yeah, that is definitely a theme in my writing, that something is on my, I think it's probably one of the reasons I write. Um, one thing I noticed in Mantic was how structurally different all your poems were, which is hard for me to do because I tend to just like the same sort of rhythm. Is that organic or is that something you try to, you start with a certain way and you're like, okay, let me try it a different way. Yeah, I wish I were like that. <laughs> I was always like, I have some friends that write and they're always like writing small, beautiful, tight poems and, and sometimes I just get really expansive or I'll be really short and I, I'm like, why can't I just be like, you know, why can't I just write consistently? Because I, I don't I, I, and I have to follow what I'm writing to let me find its end because sometimes there are shorter poems that come out of me and sometimes there are longer poems. So I think it's, again, it's like a picture of my mind. I'm a little bit more expansive at times and less expansive at times. How, how do you know when it's the end? Because you said that you, know, you want to write to see something through and sometimes it's a short poem and sometimes you need yes. room. How do you know when it's over? I think, well, that, all, that old phrase of, you know, when it's abandoned is sometimes, you know, sometimes I can write something like, yes, that's it. I just feel like that is as far as I want to go. But other times, like this project has sort of been something I feel like I could keep going with. Um, so, I, and, and I guess in, uh, when I grow tired of it, <laughs> and I, can't, I can't, it's resolving itself because I've gone over it so many times, I can't go over it one more time and, and I think that, that's kind of a cop-out way, maybe, but um, it's finished when it's abandoned is, is kind of a, a good mainstay. But, but there are some poems that I've gone back and 
you know, reworked completely and it looks totally different. So it's a mystery in some ways, you know, when it does end and maybe it doesn't. I mean, I know there are people that continually edit their work even after it's been out in the world. Um, so just keep hammering at it. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about your writing process? Like, do you compose on a computer? Do you write every morning? Do you read poetry to get inspired? Any, any little any, tidbits? Because um, everybody's writing process is different, but right. I think we can try out other people's habits. Yeah, well, I, I, I do try and write regularly because I feel better when I write and I'm able to just, you know, express, you know, whether it comes to anything or not, it feels good to write. Um, but I take a lot of notes through the week and I don't always have time to process what I write. And then um, when I get the chance to really like kind of lie around in what I've written and look through my notes, I usually do end up composing like on, on a computer. And I do usually surround myself with other writing of, you know, other authors, other poems. Um, actually, one of the things I wanted to point out in this um, particular essay too, there was a moment I think in the beginning, you know, where someone posted on my Facebook wall, and I actually took some of those excerpts and used them in the, um, the lecture, which I meant to say in the beginning. But so sometimes I will, and, and that was like a first for me to actually like kind of footnote, although I have some footnoted poems in um, Mantic. Um, but I do like to, to sort of absorb other writing while I'm working on something. Um, so yeah, so it is inspired often by other work. and I, and. Um, some of the techniques, like just you know, even taking some of my own work and chopping and changing and um, throwing things around, uh, it gives me a new way of looking at something. If I get stuck, that's been one way I, I really like to just, you know, and I think that's I, I because I'm not able to write, and I don't know how many people really can write all the time, but because I feel like I come at my writing in such a fragmented way. Um, that I, and maybe that I'm you know fragmented in my process as well, um, with time and with how I create. All right. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much.